stages of grief. Okay? Um, the person who came up with that was Elizabeth Kugler-Ross. So make sure you get that name down. Elizabeth Kugler-Ross. Ross, R-O-S-S. Kugler is her, well, her maiden name. C-U-B-L-E-R. And there's a, I don't know if that's an umlaut in German. Two dots over the, over the U. Doesn't matter. But she's a Swiss, she was a Swiss psychologist. And she did a lot of great work on dealing with grief. She started, um, I mean, the way she started this lifelong, uh, this lifelong mission or lifelong, she wasn't a Christian, but her lifelong ministry to people that are grieving, it was after World War II, she was a teenager. And in Switzerland, they had, uh, concentration camps, people from the Holocaust, survivors, and helping them in the camps because, you know, the survivors of the Holocaust, they lost everything, absolutely everything. Their families, their homes, all their money, everything. And so working with those survivors, she started to, you know, do this work on grief and it, it really kind of shaped her whole life. In the 60s, she wrote a landmark book called On Death and Dying. And then she came to the United States and really did a lot of good work because, you know, when it comes to dealing with grief and death, um, we tend to avoid that. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to deal with that. that um, as, as a chaplain that I always hated doing, and I know this is true of all chaplains, has to be, is making death notifications. When you're the on-call duty chaplain, you know, you get the call and you got to drop everything. You have to go, you have to go to the casualty notification office, you got to put on your dress uniform, and Nothing else happens until that notification is made, you know. And so you're going with the notification, NCO or officer, depends on the rank of the person who has died. And you have to knock on their door and notify them, officially notify them. Um, several of these. Now, I, I haven't done as many as some, some chapels have done because I was deployed a lot. I've been deployed four times. I was deployed a lot, so uh, I'd have to deal with death on, you know, the, where it happens in Iraq and dealing with the soldiers that are left behind and, and all of that. Dealing with the families, I didn't have to do as much. I have to do, I've had to do maybe a dozen, but um, a turning point for me came once when I was on, I was an on-call duty chaplain uh, in Hawaii at Schofield Barracks, and we would cover the whole island for the Army. And early in the morning, it was about 5 o'clock in the morning, I got the call from the casualty notification office, hey, get your uniform on, you got to come in. Um, so I got in there early, I got there about 7, 6.37, and we were the secondary notification. The primary notification is the primary next of kin, which was the guy's wife. And then, uh, and, and was off island. We had to wait to make, we had to wait until the notification came back that they had contacted the wife for myself and the other, uh, the notification officer, who was a, a master sergeant, to go and tell the family, the parents. So we're waiting hours until, this is afternoon middle afternoon until we find the address, we go, and by the time we got there, the parents had already found out, which, you know, kind of takes some of the, 
some of the sting out of it, you know, because we're not the ones telling them right there. But finally I got home and it was, it was evening. So I spent the whole day dealing with this. And um, that, it just blew my whole Sunday, you know. And I was feeling a little sorry for myself. A little embarrassed to say that. A little ashamed to say that. But I was feeling a little sorry for myself. And I thought, Steve, how would you want the army to tell your wife and your kids if it was you? Would you want the notification officer and the chaplain to come up and have them feeling sorry for themselves and feeling put out for having to do this? No. Or if it were my son or my daughter or my wife and they're informing me, the Army's informing me, how would I want them to do it? This is a sacred duty. This is a sacred responsibility. How would you want it done? And that made all the difference. Whenever I've had to do these since, um, I just remember, how would I want it done if it were me? Or if it were mine? If it were my family? You know? And so that's the difference. Um, probably the most dramatic one I've done is in, uh, is in Hawaii. And there were four soldiers that were killed in a helicopter crash. And so we had to go and notify the family. And I got to the notification office. The, the call came in early. We tried to catch them. This mom and her daughters before they went to school or not went off to work. And um, a, uh, a, a staff sergeant, E6, female E6, she was on the list. It was the first time that she'd ever done this. <clears throat> and she was feeling really oh so sorry for herself. So we, we went to the house. I'm driving. And she's crying. She's crying in the car. She's not crying for the family for herself, you know? Yeah, you know, she has to do this. She's all upset. So we get there, and she's still crying in the car, and she doesn't want to go in yet. And I said, come on now. You've got to pull yourself together. We've we got to do this. We've got to catch them before they go. Come on, it's not about us. Good. So we get to the door. The uh, screen door is, you know, the door's open, just the screen door. And it's about seven. And, um, knock on the door, and a lady comes to the, the door, a Filipino lady, and she's a star in my account, getting the kids ready, and she sees us, she goes, yes, and the sergeant says, are you so-and-so, the wife of so-and-so? She goes, yes, and then my counterpart just freezes. She can't say it. She's supposed to say it. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say it. I said, we have something to tell you, and it's bad news. And then she knew, you know, everybody knows. If you live in a military community, and you see two soldiers come in their dress blues together to your door, it's one, one thing. So she turned her back to us, and she just collapsed. She just sat down and collapsed, and she cried. And she was crying for like 10 minutes with her back to us, understanding that. Well, finally, I, you know, I said, hey, can I come in? And talk to you. So we came in and we were talking to her for about 10 minutes and uh, her daughters were looking in and what's wrong and mom's crying. And, you know, eventually we told her we, after about an hour, we were able to uh, get a neighbor to come over and, and be with her. But, you know, it, it is a sacred responsibility. But there's a certain danger to, I think, getting too wrapped up into this. Now, when I say this, there are a number of chaplains. I, I gave a, a talk at um, Fort Bliss, because as the family life chaplain, it was my, my primary job, although I see clients every week. My primary job was training the chaplains to become better, more professional, better equipped pastoral counselors. Because the kind of training we get in seminary, I had one counseling class. My how many? How many counseling classes did you have in seminary? None. None. I had one. And I had one because it fit into my schedule, and the president of the college said, Steve, this would be a good class for you to take. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted the theology classes, the Bible, you know, Bible classes and stuff. I don't want to take counseling classes.
But uh, the class I took was crisis intervention counseling. And as soon as I got to my first battalion, it's an infantry battalion, uh, boy, I'm so glad I took that. The th one class that you get in seminary, or two classes, or three classes, maybe enough for what you see in the local church. Maybe enough. But it's not enough for what you see in a battalion, you know. Now, an infantry battalion is big. Sometimes battalions are half this size, but I had 800 soldiers. Infantry, armor, you know, lots of problems. And I used to think the stuff on Jerry Springer was just all made up, all scripted. I don't anymore. <laughs> I think that stuff is real because I saw some of those things. I don't watch Jerry Springer, you know, but you know, you see the highlights commercials, some weird stuff, and you're talking to people and you're like, man, I don't know what to say. I don't know. So part of the Family Life Chaplain's job is to train the chaplains to help them to become better counselors, better equipped. So I was talking to them about, about grief. I lead a grief support group every month with a survivor outreach services on post for Gold Star families, Gold Star families are families that have lost a service member. And uh, so I lead this grief support group. Uh, most of them are there because of suicide. Their loved ones kill themselves. But as I was talking to the, the, the chaplains about this, there were a number of them that had been hospice chaplains. Uh, Pastor Mike is a hospice chaplain. He's seen far more death than I have. But Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is interesting to me. Now, she did lots of good work, really, in helping people to, to be interested in, in helping people that are dealing with deep grief and loss because our natural inclination, we don't know what to say, is to kind of avoid it. Um, when I would do these death notifications, the pressure's on you. You want to say something to help them, to comfort them. But what can you say? Can't say anything. There's nothing you can say that's going to make their pain go away. In fact, the best thing that you can do is just to be there with them. The Jews have a tradition of going to visit grieving families, and they don't say anything. They're just there with them. And that goes all the way back to the oldest book of the Bible. The oldest book of the Bible is not actually Genesis. It's Job. Job predates the writing of Genesis by about 400 years. Job was a contemporary of Abraham. The writer of the, of the book of Genesis, the next oldest book, is Moses. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. But predate, what predates that is Job. Now, I believe that uh, Moses edited the book of Job under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons we, well, one of the reasons I believe that, one of the reasons I believe that's true is that the name of God, Yahweh, which was revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 is inserted back in the book of Job. It appears in the book of Job. It came from Moses. Um, but in, um, in Job's deep grief, after all that had happened to him, after the loss of his children, everything that had happened to him, the first thing that his friends did when they came to visit him, because they didn't say anything. What was it, for seven days? They just waited with him. And that was the best thing they, they did. Uh, when they started giving their two cents and started, you know, telling him where he's wrong and how he's not following God and so on, that's where they messed up. But starting out, the best thing they did is they were just there with him. And, and I realized when it comes to death and dying, making these death announcements, I, I didn't have to say anything. Just be there with someone. Just wait with them. 
Now, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross kind of came to a, to a disgraceful end. Um, and I think perhaps she was too wrapped up, too absolved, or too uh, absorbed with death and dying. She got involved in, with a cult in the 70s in uh, North County of San Diego, where I'm from. I'm from San Diego in North County. Um, there was a cult there that was kind of a mind science cult um, that taught that the, it was a small cult, I mean, most cults are small, that you could contact the spirits of those that had been part of kind of like a seance type thing. And you can see why she would be interested in that, contact the spirits of those who were, who were lost. And she, you know, was one of the main contributors, small cult, about 40 people. And the cult leader and some of the other men, you know, her, his, his cronies, they would have like these seances and they turn out the lights, and then spirits, male spirits, would approach uh, young women there and fondle them, have sex with them. And the leader would tell the women, if the spirits approach you, just they, they you know, just just let uh, be be a woman with them, minister to them. Departed someone. So someone came, a man came, whose family had been used this way, family members used this way. And over the light switches, well, these aren't light switches, I don't even know what these are, but they, it was taped over. So you couldn't just flip them off. Well, he knew where the light switch was, and when this was going on, he went, put the lights on, and guess what? You know, there's a cult leader, a couple of guys naked and, you know, molesting these women. And so after that, the whole thing, it was exposed and collapsed. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was humiliated, and that was pretty much the end of her career and her influence. And then the, the cult building was eventually burned down, and, you know, it was a mess. But, that's too bad to ended that way for her, but she had done a lot of very good work on death and dying and these stages of grief. Okay? So, remember the stages of grief and the order for your midterm. You may or may not see it. Remember Elizabeth Kubler ross Okay? Any questions? Let's get started on cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is it's the leading therapy, the leading theory in counseling and psychology today. Uh, Freud's views, psychotherapy, pretty much been just Rejected. Nobody really uses them anymore. Not popular. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, but cognitive behavioral therapy is the leading therapy that's used for trauma, for anxiety, for PTSD. And uh, I, I'm glad for it. It's the one that I use, primarily. I use cognitive behavioral therapy and I use solution focus. But cognitive behavioral therapy, it was started by Albert Ellis. And there's a number of different ones. REBT is the one he started. But it's, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. Changing your thoughts and your behaviors. And it basically comes down to, as we distill it down, to thinking errors. It's not what happens to you. 
It's what you think about it. It's not what happens to you. It's what you think about it. And cognitive behavioral therapy was started by Albert Ellis in World War II. And um, he based a lot, of, a lot of his theories on the ancient Stoic philosophers. And he's a Jew, he's an atheist, but uh, he still was raised in that Jewish tradition. Some of it is biblical, I think. Um, we see it's not what happens to you, it's what you think about, it's how you process it. We see that biblically. The first paragraph in the New Testament has to do with that. Now the first paragraph in the New Testament, you might be thinking, what does it say in Matthew? It doesn't say the son of, no, it's not, that's not it. Chronologically, the first book of the New Testament is James. It's James to be written chronologically. So after 400 years of silence from the writing of Malachi in the Old Testament, 400 years later, there's no scripture until the book of James. Now the first verse, to the 12 tribes who were dispersed upon greetings, but in James chapter one and verse two, it says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, when you're going through trials, you're suffering. You're not a happy camper. You're, you're in pain. But consider it all joy. It's the thinking process. It's what you think about it. It's not what happens to you. It's what you think about it. Now, oftentimes, what we, what we think about it or that filter we use to think and to attach value to the things that happen to us go all the way back to our childhoods or past traumas. And so there are thinking errors that develop as a result of those. Now, I'd like to read you these 10 primary cognitive uh, distortions or thinking errors. I got this from, um, from a website. Uh, the, the counselor that I saw, Dr. Tyler Ralston, in, I don't know, about 12 years ago in Hawaii, I was struggling with some things, PTSD, PTSD is accumulative. I've been deployed four times, always with infantry units. I was a former infantryman my, myself and a chaplain of infantrymen, special operations. And some of these things kind of catch up to you. Maybe they were catching up to me. And so I, I saw a counselor. And he's the one that really got me thinking about, you know, this stuff really does work. It really does work. There is something to these theories that can actually help us help other people, and it helped me. So I got it from his website. Uh, uh, his and his mentors, oh, I can't remember his name, I'm getting the mind blown. So it's our website now. Uh, some of the spelling on this, it's kind of Hawaii spelling. <laughs> It's kind of island spelling, you know? And, uh, uh, <laughs> and I never went through and corrected the spelling and the typos. So when you see that, uh, I'm passing the buck a little bit here. You know, it's, it's kind of an island thing. Uh, it's not, I didn't write this, okay? Um, let's talk through these. We won't get through them all tonight. But I want you to talk through it, think through it, and see if, um, if you do some of these. When I went through this for the first time, I was checking by the ones that I did. I did most of them. Yeah. Okay. The first one is dichotomizing. Viewing things in either or categories or assuming there is only two possible answers. 
A, all or nothing thinking. It's either going to happen as I want it, or it's, or it's not going to happen. All or nothing thinking. Or B, perfectionism. If it's not perfect, it's all wrong. Or if it's not perfect, I'm a loser. Anybody do that? Anybody do that? Is your hands? No? Okay, I'm the only one that does that. Okay. <laughs> Um, I can relate to the perfectionism because if it's not perfect, it's wrong. So, how much is good enough? How much is good enough? Now, I have a better example of a friend that I served with. He was another officer. Um, I had a lot in common with this guy. In fact, his name is Steve, too. Uh, had a lot in common with him, but his, he was a more extreme example than I was. Um, now Steve, um, I guess the first example I would give is that he attended uh, University of Ohio, and he was a wide receiver, and he was not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy, he was a white guy, uh, he was a wide receiver, but he thought, and you see examples of this in the NFL, uh, even though I don't have the same natural talent as some others do, with tremendous speed or jumping ability, I can run very precise routes, and I'll get open that way, and you know, he did that. He bought a, uh, one of these pass throwing machines and he'd catch 100 passes every day until his fingers bled and you know, that kind of driven person, extremely driven. But he uh, wanted to be an All-American. He thought, if I'm an All-American, everything will be okay. Well, he was, he was a wide receiver uh, uh, at this big university and he hurt his knee. So he graduated, he wasn't able to be a mall American, wasn't able to go on to the pros, but you know, still, still a collegiate athlete. Um, got his degree and thought, okay, well, I'm gonna join the Navy and be a Navy SEAL. This is pretty cool, right? Um, do you guys know what cool means? Well, Mike, you better know what that means, but uh, it's, it's, we say that in the Army. Uh, cool. H O O A H. Now, if you ask soldiers, where does that come from? What does that mean? They can't tell you either. It actually comes from, now I believe this is true, it actually comes from Hawaii, from the Vietnam War. The Hawaiians have a saying, Imua, I M U A, which means forward. It's one of the things they say. Well, the Hawaii National Guard used to say this. And soldiers coming through on their way to uh, Vietnam would go through Hawaii, and they heard the Hawaiians say, oh, oh, oh. well, it sounds like, oh, oh. and they, they kind of caught on to it. And so it's persisted in, in the army. You know? Okay, so that's kind of, kind of cool. So he wanted to be a Navy SEAL. So I went to pursue uh, Navy SEAL training, became a Navy SEAL. Uh, um, went to a Navy SEAL team. Pretty well, you know. I think that's good enough, right? It wasn't. So he's finished his Navy SEAL training. And he's on a Navy SEAL team. He's an elite warrior. He does that for a while, and it's just not. It's not good enough. He doesn't feel that it's good enough. He doesn't feel good about himself. He doesn't feel that that's enough. So he finishes his enlistment, gets out of the Navy, joins the Army. Because in the Navy, you really cannot go from enlisted to officer very easily. You just, you just can't. So he thought, well, if I become an officer. 
So he gets out, he goes into uh, officer candidate school with the Army, becomes an officer, is commissioned as an infantry officer. Um, so he's an officer now, but that wasn't enough. Goes to ranger school, becomes a airborne ranger. That's pretty well too. Um, his first assignment was to 315 Infantry. I was a battalion chaplain. Third Infantry Division. I wasn't really happy with that because it wasn't the elite of the elite. Well, you know. So he comes to us. Um, 2005, we go to Sadr City in Baghdad. And he's a platoon leader, going on missions. You know. That wasn't enough. He's accomplished all these things, but it wasn't enough. Now he's married, he's a Christian guy too. Beautiful wife, two beautiful daughters, two little girls, they own a home. What more could you want? Well, um, when we were in Sutter City, he was training to go, he got accepted to go to the Ranger Regiment, one of the Ranger Battalions. And because of his background as a Navy SEAL, he was selected to be in the Ranger uh, Recon platoon or company. So these Ranger battalions, there's only three. They're, they're elite. They're like special forces, in fact. They're more elite than special forces. Special forces mission is they go in and they train the, the uh, indigenous people how to resist and stuff. But the Rangers really are the top trigger pullers in the Army. So he's going to their recon platoon, so the elite of the elite of the elite. And I, we lost contact with each other. But I remember sitting and talking to him. We're friends and saying, Steve, how much is enough? How much is enough? So you pushed yourself in the football, and you got your education, and you became a Navy SEAL, and then you became an officer, you're an infantry officer, you're an airborne ranger, you're a successful um, um, infantry officer. You know, you're, when I first met him, he was a uh, first lieutenant, now he's a captain, so we're both captains. And now you're going to the rangers, but after a while, that's not going to be enough either. When is it going to be enough? See, the way that you're approaching this, it's doomed for failure. Because after a while, you make this achievement and you work so hard for this achievement, but those feelings of not being good enough, of it not being perfect, if it's not perfect, I'm a loser. Nothing is perfect this side of heaven. So I would talk to him about that, and finally he told me, he said, you know, and I hope this sank in with him, because uh, we are friends, I, I do care about him. I wish I hadn't lost contact with him, tried to find him, but I haven't been able to. Um, he said, you know, I, I didn't want to be like my dad. Is one of the reasons I push myself so much. I don't want to be like my dad. Because his dad uh, killed himself. So the reason he would push himself, push himself, push himself. And at a certain point, you just can't push yourself anymore. Um, you can't make that next thing. Maybe there is nothing more you can do. Until you Accept yourself. You're not a loser. You're not like your dad. I think his brother kind of went the other way, just sort of fell apart and went into drugs and stuff. So, does that make sense? Okay. Dichotomize. And I, I've kind of done that in my life. Okay, number two. Overgeneralization. Taking a single event or characteristic and turning it into a general pattern. Labeling. 
an extreme form of overgeneralization. Instead of describing your error, I forgot to pay the phone bill. And you see that kind of Y spelling there uh, for phone. <laughs> you attach a negative label to yourself. I'm a loser. Or when someone else's behavior rubs you the wrong way, rather than telling yourself or him, I don't like it when he, you, forget to say thank you. You attach a negative label to him. He is, you are, an insensitive jerk. Mislabeling involves describing an event with language that is highly colored and emotionally loaded. Labeling usually involves turning a behavior into a negative character trait. and then you think I'm worthless. You forget to do what? Pay a bill, you forget to uh, forget an appointment, whatever. And you turn that back on yourself because I forgot that thing, which is not a big thing. Because I forgot that thing, it means I'm a loser. Or you can turn it around somebody else, like a spouse. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, you guys do that. You do that? I do. Yeah. Um, and being extremely hard on ourselves. unrealistically hard on ourselves. All right. Number three, negative filtering. Uh, with this labeling and these overgeneralizations, if, if you are sitting with someone and you can see they do this, what do you do? someone else say, sitting in that chair and they had uh, forgot to pay something or forgot to do something would you would you tell them or would you think about them and what a loser but, no no you wouldn't but you do that to yourself Some of these things start in childhood, too. And um, would you tell yourself at that age, I'm a loser anymore. Of course not. But you do it to yourself all the time. I think sometimes we think, uh, because I'm doing this to myself, it's okay. You know, it's not. It's not okay to do that to yourself. Do you think God approves of that? No, he doesn't. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. Number three negative filtering. Picking out a single negative detail and dwelling on it exclusively so that eventually your whole vision of all reality becomes gloomy and negative. Picking out a single negative detail and having that color the whole thing.
So, are you looking at it objectively? When you do that? No, you're not. Um, I guess an example of this might be um, like in a message, a sermon, and that I record it, or if I videotape myself, and I'm teaching, and I say something, but I thought, oh, I could have said that better, or I missed something, or I didn't phrase that very well. And if I'm just thinking about it afterwards, it's bugging me, and it it, it kind of tarnishes the whole, the whole message. But when I listen to it, or I, I watch it uh, on video, I don't even notice it, you know. I think it goes back to being uh, too hard on ourselves, picking out that one thing, and it kind of goes back to the perfectionism, doesn't it? And it's just all bad. That's not true. Through this, and we'll see this through all the thinking errors, there, there needs to be an objectivity where you can kind of step outside of your own skin and look objectively at yourself. And as, as helpers, as counselors, as one who is called alongside to help, uh, we need to help other people to be able to do that themselves too. To be fair to themselves. To try to think objectively. We're going to come to, um, let's see, emotional reasoning number seven. That's a huge one. In fact, let's skip ahead. We'll come back to the others next week. But, and we'll talk about this again. It's one of those that we really can and should talk about twice. Emotional reasoning. Assuming that your negative emotions, number seven, necessarily reflect the way things really are. I feel it. Therefore, it must be true. Coming to conclusions and making decisions based on emotions rather than facts, evidence, and logic. Okay, so because I feel something or I feel a certain way, then it must be true. That's emotional reason. Well, what could, um, what could cause you to feel a certain way about something? Remember I told you about um, that, that young lady, actually it was one of Dr. Ralston's clients, who had a phobia about taking showers and baths. This room, remember we talked about that? No? I'll tell you about it again. Uh, it's a young lady, she's in her late, late 20s, and she came to counseling really at the end of her road. And she, um, she didn't like taking showers. She didn't like taking baths. They made her very uncomfortable. She just couldn't, just couldn't do it. And the most she would do to kind of wash up is she kind of wash up a little bit in the sink, you know, uh, and I went back about it. And maybe some guys would say, oh yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, women, you know, I mean, cleaner. Her, uh, her social life was non-existent, you can imagine. Uh, she was kind of dirty and uh, never had any friends, had any friends, uh, had a hard time making a living. And the color red really bothered her. If she were to walk in the 
this room, seeing the red countertop, red bookshelf, the red couch there, she would not feel red on the floor. She would not feel good about that. In fact, she probably couldn't stay in the room. And she didn't know why. She didn't know why red made her stomach clench and why it made her so uncomfortable. She didn't know why uh, showers and baths bothered her so much. And what do you think she thought about herself? She's dirty. She's dirty. She can't handle down a job. She doesn't have any friends. Guys don't want to date her. So she turned it all in her, on herself and thought, oh, I'm just a loser. Uh, emotional reasoning. As it turned out, as she came and as she's talking to uh, Dr. Ralston, who is a wonderful counselor, is a wonderful counselor, uh, he noticed the things that she was saying that are typical of people that have encountered trauma. As it turned out, as I continued to talk, when she was a freshman in college, she was taking a shower. It's either in her dorm or in her apartment, but some guy had broken in, and I think she knew him. Some guy had broken in and sexually assaulted her in the shower. And she didn't tell anybody. Most rapes go unreported. I've had a lot of clients, unless you had a lot of clients who have been sexually assaulted. They didn't tell anybody. Because of the shame involved, so forth. Um, and you could guess what color the shower curtain was, right? Red. So she repressed this. She pushed it down. She didn't want to see it. She didn't want to deal with it. She didn't want to think about it. But when you push down trauma, it comes back up. It's like a deep splitter. I don't know if you've ever had a real deep splitter. But eventually, your body pushes it out. Sometimes soldiers get uh, shrapnel, shrapnel wounds in their bodies. And it would cause more damage for the doctors to go in and dig it out than it would for the body just to eventually push it out to the surface. And then it's very easy for the doctors to extract. Trauma's like that, too. You can push it down. You can deny it that it didn't happen. But it did. And it comes back out. So once she was able to face it and deal with it and they could talk about it, she could eventually, you know, she'd just kind of stand in the shower fully clothed, you know, without the water on, and eventually do a little more and a little more and a little more, and it broke uh, that trauma's hold on her. And that's true with like phobias. You have to face them bit by bit by bit until it's broken. Trauma thrives on avoidance. You should write that down. Trauma thrives on avoidance. Uh, people with post-traumatic stress disorder avoid certain things that make them uncomfortable. And the more they avoid it, the more it gets its claws in you, the more it gets its hold on you. And you break its hold on you by, by facing it. Once you face it, it breaks a hold on you. Part of it is, is that it reminds you of the trauma. It's like red reminded her of the trauma. There's nothing wrong with red, but it was breaking that connection. That's an emotional reasoning. Just because you feel something doesn't mean it's true. Doesn't mean it's valid. And you have to think your way through it using logic, reason. Does that make sense? We're going to talk about that again because that is a huge thing, and it really is an enormous part of cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay? All right. Any questions? Trauma thrives on avoidance. Yeah. And the more we avoid something because it makes us uncomfortable, the more it gets us, the more it gets its claws into us.
if you now I put that in the syllabus as that's an assignment that you could do right at the end of class, you know, at the end of the semester. But if you want to do that and get it out of the way, you can either turn in the whole book, no mistakes, handwritten, or you can get up and read the chapter from Philippians. Now I'll pick the chapter you have to read and that's okay. Chapter three, chapter one. Uh, now, because we're not going to take the time, our class time is so limited in here, to listen to the whole book. We'll listen to a chapter. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's close with a word. Father, thank you for this time with my brothers and my sisters. Lord, as we, as we study about how to be the one who comes alongside to help, there's always been helping people, helping others. Uh, a brother is born for a person. Pray that we would be that person there to help. And we would have a better idea how to help. Um, counseling does work. And especially for those of us who know you and love you and your Holy Spirit flows through us. So Lord, we thank you and praise you. Thank you for my brother.